This is a pedigree, and a uh, pedigree is just a family history where you're following one specific trait, oftentimes a genetic disorder, through a family. So the one and the two and the three here indicate different generations. So one would be grandparents, two, their children or the parents, and then three, um, their children or the um, children, so grandparents, parents, and children. And the, the convention in pedigrees is that a square indicates a man and a circle indicates a woman. If the square is empty, not filled in, then that person does not have or display the disorder. If the circle or square is filled in, it means that they do have um, or display the disorder. I would like you to answer three specific questions. Um, first of all, ask yourself, based on what you're looking at in the pedigree, is this autosomal inheritance um, or sex-linked? Meaning, is it on chromosomes 1 through 22? Or is it on the X or Y chromosome? The second question I want you to ask yourself is, is this a dominant or recessive trait? And then number three, there's often going to be a question mark um, related to a baby. So, and what that question mark is asking you is, what are the chances? What's the probability that this individual will have the disease? And so what you want to do is you want to start at the top um, to do this and to answer each question. And you'll need to use Punnett squares more often than not. Um, I'm going to give you a few hints for the first two on how to easily answer these by glancing at the entire pedigree. Um, first, for autosomal versus sex-linked, for autosomal, if you look across the pedigree and it looks like a, about a 50-50 ratio men to women have the disorder and you don't see any clear patterns in the pedigree like all the women are carriers and only men have the disease, it's likely autosomal. Um, Sex linked, you're going to see clear patterns, and usually more men are going to be um, having the disorder. One thing I forgot to say, it's because it's not shown on this pedigree specifically, is that in the pedigrees that I give you, um, there will either be a dot or the pedigree will be half filled in, and this can be for men or for women, when they are carriers, which means that they have one bad gene, but they don't display um, they don't actually have the disorder. Uh, and it, you would only know they're a carrier if you had actually looked at their genes and measured their genotype or looked at their parents. So these carriers. And if you see carriers, then you know that it must be a recessive trait because remember, like Huntington's, if you're a heterozygote in Huntington's, you have Huntington's. But if you're a heterozygote with cystic fibrosis, you're a carrier because it's the recessive gene that carries the, the mutation. Um, and so that gets to the dominant or recessive and how to figure that out. So if a trait is dominant, you're going to see it present in every single generation, just like you see on this pedigree. So it's in the grandparents, the parents, and the children. And a parent must have the disease to pass it on to their offspring. They may not pass it on to every single offspring, especially if they're marrying a normal individual. We don't know um, if this individual is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, if this is a dominant um, trait. The other thing that you'll note is that the um, normal child here married to a normal child cannot pass on the disease. So it's not like this person is a hidden carrier or anything like that. Okay, so now to figure out number 13. 
what the chances are that that child will have the disease, we need to know uh, the genotype of number 11 here and number 12. And to figure out that genotype, we have to go back here uh, to number 2 and to, um, and to number 1. And so what I want you to note here is that there's two possibilities if this is as we're thinking it is because the disease is present in every single generation dominant inheritance. And it's autosomal because I don't see any uh, differences with more males having the disease or female carriers or any sort of pattern between the sexes. So I think this is autosomal and I think it's dominant. So autosomal dominant. And so when I look at um, this person, let's say that this is uh, Huntington's disease. This person could have HH or they could have big H, little h, and we're not sure. We know that the healthy individuals must be little h, little h, because Huntington's is dominant. So if you have one bad copy, then you will get the disease. So we could do two, two separate Punnett squares. Um, we know that the husband has little h, little h, so the wife might have big H, big H. And if she did, and we did the Punnett square, draw my square out here, then all of the children, 100%, would be heterozygous. And heterozygotes with a dominant disorder definitely have the disease. The H, the big H, is carrying the Huntington's mutation. So, if you look at the pedigree though, they have many children, two children, who are healthy and don't have Huntington's disease. So that means that this is not uh, possible and that instead the mother must have been a heterozygote for Huntington's disease. And because she's a heterozygote and she married a homozygous recessive man, if you do the uh, Punnett square there, you'll see that the only possibility for a child that has the disease is to be is to be heterozygous as well. So we figured out that this guy is heterozygous and his wife is healthy, so she must be homozygous recessive. And so we just did that cross. Um, so then we know that 50% of their children are going to be heterozygous and have Huntington's disease. And 50% are going to be homozygous and not have Huntington's disease. So this again is an example then of an autosomal dominant, um, autosomal dominant pedigree.